sharing my time with the member from St. John's East. I think I'll start, Madam Speaker, by picking up on the question that the member from Don Valley East asked of uh, the member from um, my neighboring riding. Uh, and, and that was specifically with respect to whether or not she believed that climate change was real. And I think, and it's not just about uh, her response, it's about all of the non-response responses we get to that question from the other side of the House. Because, Madam Speaker, I think what we have to do is listen to her non-answer, listen to the continual non-answer, and ask ourselves why it is. One of two things is happening, Madam Speaker. One, Conservatives and this member doesn't believe that climate change is real and just doesn't want to answer the question. Or two, and I would submit to you, Madam Speaker, this is probably the more plausible explanation, is that they do believe that climate change is real, but they're so petrified of, telling, of saying it and their base hearing it. Imagine, Madam Speaker, being part of a political party that you are so petrified of what your base, how your base might react to hearing the truth come out of your mouth. And that's where we see the Conservative Party of today. And you know, Madam Speaker, earlier we've heard Conservatives talk about how the federal government supposedly forced the provinces into this position. And I'm so glad to hear my uh, colleagues from the Bloc Québécois point out the reality of the situation, which is that unfortunately for the Conservatives' narrative, Quebec and Ontario have been a decades ahead of the rest of, 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 the, of Canada as a whole when it comes to pricing pollution. It was Quebec and Ontario that went and met with Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor of California, and, 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 and ironed out the deal, ironed out the deal of, uh, of cap and trade. That was back in 2006. The member from Don Valley East was part of the provincial government at the time when they did that. You know, a number of members of this House were. So for the Conservatives to walk in here and suddenly suggest that carbon pricing is a brand new concept, completely unforeign to, to Canadian soil, is absolutely ludicrous, Madam Speaker. It is something that we've seen Quebec and Ontario partner on and go, go bit ahead of the game uh, in, in terms of uh, responsible leadership on that, going straight to states in, in the United States, California in particular, and working on this. And you know, so I find it incredibly rich, but you know, there's another individual who supports carbon pricing that the Conservatives might listen to, Madam Speaker. You know who that is? That's their former, 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 former leader, Stephen Harper. I know there's a lot of formers in there, but Stephen Harper believes in price and pollution. He actually said in 2008, he said, our plan will effectively establish a price on carbon. That's what Stephen Harper wanted. And, and, and where are we today, Madam Speaker? You know, Ten years ago, people thought, wow, Stephen Harper's government is so non-progressive. But just think, Madam Speaker, think of where we are today. This current form of a conservative movement is so much further less progressive than Stephen Harper even was. They full-on reject the notion that climate change is real. They insist on the fact that a basic fundamental principle of the economic system, how you incentivize choice in the marketplace, they reject the notion of it. Conservatives, of all people, those that purport themselves to be the saviors of the economy, those that understand economic principle better than just about anybody else, they always will tell you that, cannot comprehend a simple concept like putting a price on something will change the behavior within the marketplace. How is it that we get to this place where this conservative movement won't even accept this reality of economic, of, of a fundamental economic principle? And so that's where, that's where we are, Madam Speaker, and I know they're heckling me because they, they don't want to hear me say it, but you'd think that they would have learned over the last three or four years of listening to me speak that the more they do it, the more it just encourages and boldens me to continue, so I will. But you know, I want to talk about a company, Madam Speaker, that recently decided and chose loyalists.
I am going to ask the honourable members to please respect the person who is speaking before I have to take other actions. The honourable member for uh, the honourable parliamentary secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know there was a company that recently chose over two locations in the United States. Detroit being one. I can't remember the other one. They chose to set up their new uh, multi-billion-dollar facility, not in my riding, just outside of my riding. And the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington in her riding. She was there at the announcement when the Prime Minister made the announcement and she was quite excited about it at the time, as she should be. The, 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 uh, the company called Umicore decided to set up its brand new battery manufacturing plant of lithium batteries right outside of my riding in her riding of Hastings, Lennox and Addington. But what was the most telling thing about that, Madam Speaker, is when the CEO was asked, why did you choose Ontario over Detroit and other options? Why did you choose this area? And you know what the answer was? The answer, Madam Speaker, was because we're making a sustainable product. We see ourselves as corporate leaders in sustainability. And when we put inputs into our product, we want to make sure that they are clean. And they recognize that because of the great leadership, like the member from Don Valley East and other li provincial liberals from uh, uh, a few years ago, we no longer burn coal in Ontario. We have the cleanest energy grid of all the options that those companies are looking for. So, Madam Speaker, where are we in the world right now? We are at a place where it's no longer just individuals demanding sustainability and saying, I choose sustainability over profit or I choose sustainability over, over uh, money. It is now companies that are actively saying, I don't want to set up in an area where I know that the resources that are going into my product are harming the environment. And that's exactly what we're seeing now, Madam Speaker. We've got to the point where even corporations understand the fact that clean energy is absolutely key. Yet, we don't even have a Conservative Party where a member will stand up and say, yes, I believe in climate change. The member was asked a direct, straightforward, simple question from the member from Don Valley East. Do you believe climate change is real? And it was a complete non-answer. It's just so easy to stand up and say, yes, I believe climate change is real. But the member refused to do that. And I don't understand why. Was, they're mouthing yes to me now. But now you just have to verbalize it. Allow the voice to come out of your mouth and, and and, and admit that you believe climate change is real. That's all we're asking conservatives to do. You, I know you have. I know they have it in them, Madam Speaker. And they're this close. And I'm here to be that support that they need in doing that. Madam Speaker, I know you want to uh, interrupt me and uh, to start question period. And I look forward to continuing afterwards. The honourable member will have two minutes after question period to conclude his speech and uh, have the questions and comments period. Statements by members. The honourable member for Mississauga Streetsville. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Canadian cycling team led by Olympic champion Kelsey Mitchell raced at the UCI Track Cycling World Championships in France. It was that track that Mississauga Zone Dylan Bibbick from Streetsville became the first man to win the gold medal in his event. And he did it in at his World Champs debut at just 19 years old. Dylan won the 15-kilometer scratch race with an average speed of over 54 kilometers an hour. He's only the second male Canadian to win gold on that track. Dylan is now looking forward to the training for his upcoming races at the Elite UCI Track Champions League. It is a sincere and exciting privilege to congratulate Dylan for his historic win at Track Woods, Track Worlds. Streetsville is proud of you, Dylan. Felicitations, Streetsville. Congratulations, Streetsville is proud of you. Rainbow Jersey, and we are all excited to follow your journey at the 2024 Summer Olympic Games in Paris. Merci, 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 Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mission Matsky Fraser Canyon. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Abbotsford Rugby Football Club is celebrating its 50th season. Established in 1972 with just one men's team, it now boasts over 11 active men and women's teams with players ranging from five all the way to 70 years of age. 
In its 50 years, Abbotsford has won 30 provincial championships and 55 players have represented Canada in world championships, test matches, sevens and the Olympics. For those of us in the house that have played this wonderful game, we know that rugby has a special and unique culture like none other. Here, here. While two players may smash each other on the field, you will see them enjoying a post-game brewski meal and a French friendly handshake at the clubhouse. Rugby brings people together like no other sport and it builds strong communities. Thank you to all the players, coaches and volunteers who have made the Abbotsford Rugby Football Club so successful. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cloverdale, Langley City. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Saturday was Election Day for municipalities across British Columbia. I'm pleased to stand in the House today to thank the previous mayors and councillors for all their work, and I congratulate those who were newly elected or re-elected to these leadership roles. From Cloverdale, Langley City, I look forward to working with mayors-elect Nathan Pahal from Langley City, Eric Woodward from Township of Langley, and Brenda Locke from Surrey. I also want to thank all those who put their names on the ballot and their families. It takes courage to put one's name forward to serve your community, and it can only be done with the support of family behind you. Democracy is more fragile than many of us realize, and I appreciate all candidates and those who voted during this election. I believe that municipal governments and the federal government can come together to solve our most pressing issues. Protecting the environment, fighting climate change, building affordable housing and combating homelessness are the first issues that come to mind. This can all be achieved through collaboration and respect. I look forward to working with the new mayors and councillors. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Abitabi Bay James. Mr. Speaker, on December 20th, the Val d'Or firefighters were called to a fire in a factory where d dismantling work was being done. While fighting the fire, one of the firefighters fell into a seven meter hole partially covered by steel plates. His colleagues went to his aid in tough conditions due to the lack of visibility, the fire, and the difficult access. The victim eventually got out with only some injuries. It took remarkable professionalism, unparalleled mental strength, and intense physical effort to rescue their colleague in distress. The government of Quebec has awarded the Medal for Meritous Action to the five firefighters of the Val d'Or Fire Department who came to the aid of their colleague and who helped him avoid the worst. I would like to congratulate the firefighters Luc Geron, who is my former colleague, Sébastien Ménard, Carl Hanbury, Jean-Christian Pichetin, and Matthew Lachine. Bravo and thank you. The Honourable Member for Nicobelt. Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate my nephew, Michel Gervais, who is an ardent 2SLGBTQ plus community activist and president of the West Nipissing Pride Group. And putting Sudbury, Nickel Belt, Sturgeon Falls on the map. He has been casted to be a contender on the second season of Call Me Mother, a drag competition reality show on Out TV, which is the first episode will be airing October 26. Series is hosted by Entertainment Tonight Canada reporter Dallas Dixon. The show allows prominent LGBTQ 2S plus across Canada in a drag competition, which will see up and coming drag performers. Je suis fier de Michel. I'm proud of Michel. And we are very proud that he is supporting his community. And I would encourage parliamentar parliamentarians to support the queer communities in their endeavors so they can extend their rights. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Runaway inflation is hurting Canadian students. The University of Alberta Food Bank is facing the highest demand ever. In the past year, the food bank has gone from serving fewer than 300 families to more than 1,100 clients. Wow. Most of these new food bank users are international students. Four liter of milk is a dollar more than last year. Bread, 60 cents more for a loaf. That may not seem like much to the prime minister, but it is a hardship for students and fixed budgets. With price hikes already on textbooks, and rent. No wonder students cannot afford to feed themselves. Why is this government making it so hard for students to be successful? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Yukon. 
week, the Yukon celebrates Small Business Week while also marking Poverty and Homelessness Action Week with the theme, Healing Hearts, Building Relationships. Surely there is no better time to promote our local economies while reaching out to those who are struggling. I'm proud to be part of a government that is creating an economy that works for all Canadians. I'm also proud of our government's support for innovative enterprises like Cascadene Designs and Anto Yukon in my riding. Yesterday, we announced almost $200,000 towards these two women-owned Yukon businesses, helping them scale up their reach in Yukon and beyond. Investing in Canada's small and medium-sized businesses means that we all prosper. Meanwhile, Coast Mountain Sports in Yukon is stepping up to help support homeless and housing insecure people at this time of year. Their Share the Warmth program allows customers to exchange their winter jackets towards purchase of a new one, with proceeds donated through the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition to help those in need. When we support local businesses, they in turn invest in our communities. Happy Small Business Week, Yukon. Bravo. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Vimy. Mr. Speaker, I rise in the House today to recognize that October is Autism Acceptance Month. As a nation, we have made great strides in our knowledge of the autism spectrum, and much of this success is due to the efforts of organizations like the Autism and PDD Society of Laval. But there still is much to be done. Persons on the spectrum are an essential part of our society, and we as a people are stronger because of their contributions. That is why all of us must continue to raise awareness and acceptance for persons on the autism spectrum, and I encourage us to go further and create inclusive communities for neurotypical and neurodivergent persons alike. We all deserve a dignified place in our society. People living with autism are no exception. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Niagara Falls. Mr. Speaker, this morning I had the pleasure to meet with members from the Tourism Industry Association of Canada. Tourism matters. It, it, it enables economic development and job creation. My community of Niagara Falls is the number one leisure tourism destination in all of Canada, generating some $2.4 in receipts, and more importantly, it employs almost 40,000 workers. The recovery of Canada's visitor economy is key to Canada's overall economic growth, and I encourage all members of this House to meet with representatives of TIAC to discuss the impact tourism has not only on this country, but also in each of our communities. As they say, all politics is local, and so too is tourism. As the newly appointed Shadow Minister for Tourism, I am committed to working with our Canadian travel and tourism stakeholders, including members of TIAC, to find creative and innovative ideas to expedite and support the recovery of our tourism sector across Canada, including in my home communities of Niagara Falls, Niagara-on-the-Lake, and Fort Erie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Burnaby North Seymour. Mr. Speaker, our community has suffered an incalculable loss. Constable Shailene Yang was killed in the line of duty on Tuesday. At 31, in the prime of her life, she was working every day to make our community a better place. As I stood with all of you in silence yesterday, honouring her memory and her service, I struggled to find the words that I might say to her family and to her loved ones. I think about the families of her fellow officers whose partners and mothers and fathers continue to serve so selflessly so that we can all be safe. So I'd like to ask that all Canadians who might hear this very short speech, one point or another, take some extra effort to appreciate a first responder. It might be a police officer, a firefighter, a paramedic or a nurse. It would be a great way to honour Shailene's service and honestly it is impossible for any one of us to say thank you enough. The Honourable Member for Lambton Kent Middlesex. Speaker, this week is Small Business Week, a time to celebrate the backbone of Canada's economy. Small business owners are our unsung heroes who employ nearly two thirds of workers across this country. From my riding of Lambton Kent Middlesex to Victoria to Whitehorse to Regina to Halifax, millions of Canadians rely on meaningful paychecks from small businesses to feed their families. The new Conservative leader will put the people first, their paychecks, yeah. their savings, yeah. their homes and their country. Conservatives will fight the Liberal government's high payroll taxes, carbon tax, wasteful, wasteful spending and 
and careless attitude that is costing hardworking Canadians their jobs. This Small Business Week, I encourage everyone to shop local, support small business, and know that Conservatives are doing the same. To all Canadians who own or work for a small business, thank you for what you do. You're here. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for King Vaughan. Mr. Speaker, first-time home buyers in Canada are giving up on the idea of ever owning a home due to the housing crisis. The average cost of a detached home in my riding of King Vaughan is $1.8 million. Canadians are already struggling with their budgets. Buyers are not able to qualify for a mortgage. This is due in part to the high interest cost by the Bank of Canada. The qualification processes used by financial institution includes principal and interest, property tax, and of course, heating costs. The, trip, the tripling of the carbon tax will further reduce the purchasing power. This government has created more problems than it is solving in our housing market. This government needs to commit to stopping the tax increase. The dream of home ownership under this government has become a nightmare. Mr. Speaker, this government must demonstrate compassion and understanding towards Canadians' desire to own a home. Conservatives will work to make this a reality. The Honourable Member for Chateau Gay Lacol. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. During this National Small Business Week, I am proud of our government's support for innovative projects that move our economy, community, and country forward. In Chateau Gay Lacol, at Logiag, specialists in agronomy and agricultural engineering are helping producers adopt innovative and sustainable practices. Thanks to the Clean Technology in Agricultural program, LOGIAG will calculate the carbon sequestered by agricultural land, thus participating in our GHG reduction strategy. Mr. Speaker, this is just one of many examples of the contributions of our small and medium businesses. Together, we will build an economy that benefits everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Mr. Speaker, as a proud Hamiltonian, it's an honour to rise in this House and report that the spirit of 46 is alive and well in the NDP caucus. We continue our fight for workers' rights to collectively bargain with their employers and, when necessary, withdraw their labour in order to push back against attacks on their wages, working conditions, pensions and benefits. For decades, New Democrats have introduced anti-scab legislation in this House to ensure that during labour disputes, the use of scab replacement workers doesn't undermine workers' ability to negotiate fairly or hurt labour relations. Scabs prolong strikes and lockouts and give employers little incentive to reach a fair deal. In the past, Liberals and Conservatives teamed up and voted against our anti-scab legislation. Mr. Speaker, today I am proud to also report that we haven't stopped fighting for workers and have used our power in this Parliament to force the Liberals to include legislation to ban replacement workers. That includes not just strikes, but lockouts as well. We will always fight for more democratic workplaces, democratic economies, and to improve the material conditions conditions of working class people in this country. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières, Mr. Speaker, just a few days ago, the sun set on the 38th International Poetry Festival of Trois-Rivières. In 2022, some 60 poets from around the world gave over 250 performances that were seen by tens of thousands of poetry lovers. This year, Ukraine was at the heart of the festival. With the cooperation of Ukrainian poet Dmytro Chechyak, the festival wanted to give a voice to the Ukrainians by presenting some 60 works. These were highlighted, translated, and hung on the poetry rope. I am proud of this festival's success, and I would like to warmly congratulate 
the president, Gaston Belmar, the general manager, Marise Baribot, as well as the entire team who have made Trois-Rivières the poetry capital of the world. In addition to adding to the beauty of the world, and in the words of one spectator, the festival is a break for the soul and the heart. Thank you. Well, member for Foothills. Prices are up 11 percent, and Canadians are struggling to put healthy food on the table because of Liberal inflation. Now, the Liberals could throw Canadian families a lifeline by cancelling their planned tax hikes on food, fuel and home heating. But instead, it seems the Liberals are determined to increase the cost of living. With bad policies, like failing to establish a Canadian vaccine bank for foot and mouth disease, putting our entire livestock industry at risk by forcing front-of-pack labelling on manufacturers, failing to give a deep trust to our fruit and vegetable growers, by putting a tariff on fertiliser and on farms, by now tripling the carbon tax on farms and every aspect of our food supply chain. Grocery prices are at a 41-year high. 1.4 million Canadian kids live in households with food insecurity. Canadian families can no longer afford this Liberal government. But, Mr. Speaker, there's hope on the horizon. A new Conservative leader who does think about monetary policy will end the Liberals' unjust inflation and ensure every Canadian can put affordable food on their table. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg South. Mr. Speaker, Don Duguid won every conceivable championship in curling, including two men's world championships, three Canadian men's and a Canadian Masters Championship, to name a few. He was the face and the voice of curling, both in Canada and abroad, for almost 40 years. And no individual has had a bigger impact on the spread of curling throughout the world. He was curling's very first colour commentator, beginning a 29-year career with the CBC in 1972, followed by seven years at NBC, covering five Olympics, as well as countless Briars, Scotties and other championships. He was inducted into the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame, the Canadian Curling Hall of Fame, and was the very first inductee into the World Curling Hall of Fame. He was awarded the Order of Manitoba in 2014, and today, curling great and my father, Don Duguid, received the Order of Canada from the Governor General. Congratulations, Dad. to the galleries against the rules, but I'm not going to interrupt with Dad. Uh, Dad. <laughs> Quarrel questions, question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This Prime Minister has added a hundred billion dollars to our national debt before COVID and $500 billion to our national debt before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. He doubled the national debt by adding more debt than every other prime minister in the history of the country. And all of these dollars have increased the cost of the goods that we purchase and the interest that we pay. And yet, suddenly, the Finance Minister has done an about turn and has recognized that these inflationist deficits are increasing the cost of living. But how can we trust the people who cause the inflation to fix it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we have the lowest debt and deficit of all the G7 countries. We have also presented a budget which is going to cut spending, government spending, by $9 billion. And we also have the strongest growth in the G7. Meanwhile, the Conservatives are playing uh, petty political games, but our government is taking real action. Our government uh, brought Moderna to Montreal. Our government is going to make sure that our economy is resilient over the long term, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, what a flip-flop. After adding $100 billion of new debt before the first case of COVID, half trillion dollars of debt before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, doubling the debt, adding more debt than all other prime ministers combined. Now the prime minister's government is saying they're going to cut $9 billion and even bring in my pay-as-you-go law to find savings for every new dollar of spending. But wait. 
They now admit that deficits add, of inf add fuel to the inflationary fire, but can we really trust the arsonists who lit the fire to put it out? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would, uh, I would obviously pose a question, which is uh, during uh, the pandemic, what would have they cut? What supports would they not have offered to Canadians? In what way would they have not been there when Canadians needed them most? And the second question I would ask, Mr. Speaker, as we enter a time that is the most difficult, probably that the globe has faced since the Second World War, that demands responsible leadership. Uh, Amplifying anxiety is easy, Mr. Speaker. Solutions are hard. Are they going to support dental care for those that need it, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. What, we have, what, we, what would we have cut? We would have cut the $54 million Arrive Can out. Yeah. We would have cut the half billion dollars for the WE organization. We said they should never have given wage subsidies to wealthy corporations that were capable of paying out here, bonuses here. and dividends to their executives. That's an easy question to answer. In fact, $200 billion of the $500 billion in new debt in the last two years had nothing to do That's with right. COVID at all. And inflation was already spiraling out of control well before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So they should stop blaming everyone else and tell us how they're going to re re reverse the inflation That's right. that they caused. Here. Here, here. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, is stating that inflation is a problem that is only faced by Canadians. Uh, he is presuming that Canadians are not watching what's happening in the rest of the world. And I wonder, Mr. Speaker, uh, right now that he has an opportunity and they reversed the decision that they made on C30 to provide support for Canadians. They have another opportunity to reverse their position, to make sure that low-income renters have an opportunity to get the money they need in these difficult global times. They have an opportunity to make sure that those that need dental care get it. Will they reverse their position and support us in these measures? The Honourable Opposition. Uh, sorry, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. It is true that dumb governments that ran massive deficits all around the world and printed money to pay for it all have inflation problems. Countries like Switzerland that had low or no deficits have low or no inflation. This was a choice. This government decided to spend a half trillion dollars inflating the cost of living, more dollars chasing fewer goods, leads always to higher prices. And now we have 40-year highs in inflation. But how can we trust the very few people who caused this problem to fix it? Here, here, here. The House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, around the world we're dealing with uh, unprecedented times. Uh, climate change, a war that has happened in Ukraine. Uh, we're dealing with global inflation, and that demands maturity and serious answers. And I would say, Mr. Speaker, to the member opposite, that in this time, that we have an opportunity not to amplify anxiety, not to make people more scared, but to provide them real solutions. It's bad enough that they're not willing to support dental care. I'm just asking, as the House Leader, as somebody who's attempting to get that legislation and support for Canadians, will they at least stop opposing it so that the parties that do support it can get it done? The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So now he blames the war in Ukraine for inflation when less than zero 0.3% of Canada's trade is with Russia and Ukraine combined. Furthermore, the very things that the Russians and the Ukrainians produce, oil and agriculture, are abundant here at home if only the government would get out of the way and let our farmers and energy workers produce it. If we can't do that, we've got bigger problems still. It's time for them to actually take responsibility. A half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits have made life more expensive and have been bone crushing for our, our consumers. When will they reverse these inflationary policies? The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, they were, didn't support child care uh, for those that needed it to help cut it in half immediately and make sure that it goes to $10 a day. Mr. Speaker, they didn't support uh, raising uh, taxes on those who are earning the most so that we could give a break to those in the middle class. Uh, and now here we are again, Mr. Speaker, with dental care, where there's many families who are struggling because of the challenges that are happening across this globe, and they're not supporting that, Mr. Speaker. And I, I understand they're not supporting that. That's their, that's their partisan position. But will they at least get out of the way so that those of us that are trying to help Canadians right now can pass legislation? The Honourable Member for Belleuil-Chambly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Quebec right now is looking at a debate on uh, pledging allegiance to the King of England. There's also a basic principle that's being discussed, which is the monarchy. And we're told that this isn't a priority. What's a priority for this government is probably to contest Quebec's uh, secularism law. This government's priority is probably uh, to also contest their strengthening of the French language charter. But this raises a fundamental question, and I'd like to hear a clear answer from across the way when they're done chatting amongst themselves. Who is the head of state of Canada? The Honourable Justice Minister. Mr. Speaker. The uh, Pledge of Allegiance is part of our Constitution, and it has been in our parliamentary system for a long time. Mr. Speaker, it is a pledge uh, towards our institutions and our democracy, and the sovereign is part of that. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Canadian courts have made clear that this is not a pledge to the person, in this case Charles III, but rather to the state that they represent. The Honourable Member for... Belle Chambly. Uh, an oath to the King of England, who is named, is apparently a model of a democratic institution. I don't think so. This is a country where they can't tell us who is the head of state. That's, uh, that's just uh, perplexing, and yet they seem to think that this is normal. The democratically elected Prime Minister is encouraging an oath to a king, a foreign monarch. Explain that one to me. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, uh, everyone has their own priorities. On the government side, we are worried about the increases in the cost of living. We're worried about access to good housing for Quebecers, access to daycare for our kids in Quebec, Mr. Speaker, help for housing. We are there for our young people, for our workers, and for our families, Mr. Speaker. I do not understand the priorities of the Bloc Québécois. The members of the Bloc, Mr. Speaker, at the beginning they were here for their passion, but now we realize that they're here for their pensions. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. If I could have your attention, please. Order. What's going on today, but there's a lot of chatter going on, and I, it's nice to see people getting along. But uh, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we want to uh, hear the questions and uh, the responses. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. The, coup de la vie. the cost of living continues to go up. Right now, the inflation numbers for food is 11.4%. Food prices are up 11.4%. It's harder for people to buy groceries. We forced the Liberals and the Conservatives to adopt our plan to help families. When will the Liberal government implement our plan to help families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of uh, Multiculturalism. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We presented our affordability plan, which includes, as a first measure, a doubling of the GST tax credit for 11 million households in Canada. That help uh, will be going out at the beginning of November, Mr. Speaker, very soon. And we have right now before the House a proposal to help uh, Canadians, uh, low-income Canadians, pay their rent and to give uh, uh, help for kids' dental care. I hope that all parties in this House are going to vote in favour of those measures. Member for Burnaby South. Without a question, the Roger Shaw merger will be bad for Canadians, for people and for our country. There is no question this will result in job losses. We know that the Competition Bureau is also opposed to this decision. So when will the Liberal government finally stand up for people, stand up for Canadians, and oppose this merger? Yeah, yeah.
the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that greater affordability, competition and innovation in the Canadian telecommunications sector are important to us as a government as they are to all Canadians concerned about their cell phone bills and connectivity. Our government will ensure that consumers are protected and that the broader public interest is served. These goals remain front and centre as we analyze the implication of this proposed deal. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Calgary Force Lawn. Mr. Speaker, the Finance Minister had an epiphany after listening to the new Conservative leader's plan for ministers to find savings if they want to spend any new money. The only problem is, before COVID, her government ran up $110 billion in, def in debt, before the Russian invasion added a half trillion to the debt. 200 billion of that was not even COVID spending. Wow. This government would rather blame everyone else than take responsibility for their homegrown inflation issue. How can any Canadian trust this government to fix the inflation crisis they created? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Happy to address this member's question. For weeks now, the leader of the opposition has considered our pandemic spending frivolous. I respectfully disagree. I think that the Canadians, millions of Canadians who kept their jobs and stayed employed because of the queues disagree. I think the millions of Canadians who were able to feed their children because of the serve disagree. And I think the hundreds of thousands of businesses whose doors are still open today because of our investments would disagree. Thank goodness we were here because the leader of the opposition doesn't want to lead, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. The Liberals will continue to blame everyone else for their homegrown failures, and these failures are driving Canadians deeper into debt. They cancelled good Canadian energy projects, attacked our farmers, and hit Canadians with a job-killing carbon tax. They drove up inflation, made groceries, gas, and home heating more expensive, driving more Canadians to food banks and homeless shelters at an alarming rate. How can anyone believe that the same government that is pile-driving more Canadians into insolvency will give this economy a soft landing? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Deputy... Mr. Speaker, in the context of a country where fires, floods and hurricanes are already devastating our country, that in the context of a time where there is a scientific deadline, a timetable to when we must address climate change, we must make sure that we take these actions so that we don't put future generations of Canadians at risk. Mr. Speaker, I call on that member, the entire opposition, to come with us, come together in this place, and figure out a plan like we have to grow the economy, create jobs, and fight climate change. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, this government increased the debt by over $100 billion before COVID then increased the debt another $500 billion during COVID, half of which they didn't even spend on pandemic measures. But now we're supposed to believe the government has a new found religion called fiscal restraint. If they haven't shown Canadians any fiscal responsibility in seven years, why should we trust them now? Mr. Speaker, we are a fiscally responsible government. Every single year over the last seven years that we've been in government outside of the pandemic, the debt to GDP ratio has gone down. That's while well we've invested in Canadians. In fact, the poverty report came out in October. We've lifted millions of Canadians out of poverty. You know what, Mr. Speaker? 25% less seniors live in poverty today than when we took office wow. in 2015. And because that's because we're supporting Canadians. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, if this government wants to run on its record, it's going to have to own up that its spending has helped drive inflation to 40-year highs and Canadians are having a hard time putting food on the table. Even the Bank of Canada has says that inflation is a homegrown problem. So they promised to keep spending the increases now to 2% a year. Has the Deputy Prime Minister told the rest of Cabinet about this new fiscal plan? Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we know that inflation is a global problem. Uh, inflation in Canada has come down from its peak to 6.9%, but we know it is 8.2% in the United States. It's over 10% in the Euro area. It's over 10% in the OECD. Great. It's important that we continue to focus on affordability measures. It's going to make life easier for Canadians, like we did by doubling, uh, doubling the GST benefit. That's going to 11 million Canadian families that need it, Mr. Speaker, and over 50% of our seniors. The Honourable Member for Megantic-Lerable. 
a great revelation today, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Finance is now taking her inspiration from the speeches of the Leader of the Official Opposition. They finally realized that budgets don't balance themselves, and they're asking ministers to find savings before proposing new programs. Hallelujah, Mr. Speaker. The problem is that they should have done this a lot. They should have been listening to the member for Carleton a lot earlier. They added $100 million to the national debt before COVID. They added $500 billion before the war in Ukraine, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. $200 billion that had nothing to do with COVID. How can we trust this government to manage inflation, inflation that they created? The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy that the Conservative member is uh, so interested in uh, correspondence between the Minister of Finance and her colleagues. It's clear that we have a plan that is based on fiscal responsibility, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, we presented a budget that was recognized by uh, all of the experts as being fiscally responsible. And we're seeing the results of that. Our l rate of inflation is uh, uh, much lower than that of our uh, colleagues and partners around the world. And we are going to continue to make sure that we are spending in a responsible way. The Honourable Member for Megantic Lerable. Well, let's talk about fiscal responsibility, Mr. Speaker. This Prime Minister said in his first ever speech that interest rates would stay at low levels for decades to come. I remember that uh, promise, Mr. Speaker. He said there's going to be some tiny deficits because we have the means, because interest rates are going to stay low, and it's uh, not a big deal. But they've added $100 billion to the debt before COVID, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality. And now today, they're saying to Canadians, hey, trust us. We're going to manage this crisis. Well, no. Canadians don't trust you anymore. Mr. Speaker, they are no longer capable. I'm sorry. They are no longer capable of managing this crisis. Mr. Speaker, when are you going to get rid of your plan that's hurting Canadians? When will you stop increasing taxes? Once again, I'd like to remind the honourable member that uh, questions must go through the speaker and not to the speaker. The honourable uh, parliamentary secretary. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And. I do think uh, that my Conservative colleague is a bit uh, overexcited. Uh, he's attacking uh, the Bank, uh, Bank of Canada and the independence of our financial institutions. Well, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we believe in the independence of our institutions, and it was a Conservative government under Brian Mulroney that put in place the uh, Bank of Canada's uh, targets, and we think that that was a good idea. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, the minister gives a pension to the Governor General, and I'm not aware of any member of the Bloc Québécois who would re renounce their pension the day after independence is declared for Quebec. So. Maybe uh, the minister could step down, and I will remind him that he uh, swore an oath to uh, the British Crown. So who is the minister loyal to? To Canadians or to Charles III? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Now, Mr. Speaker, as a member from Quebec, as a proud Quebecer, like all my Quebec colleagues, I am here to work for the well-being of Quebecers. And that's why I'm here on this side of the House, because we're focused on increased cost of living, on help for daycares, on help for housing, on health care, Mr. Speaker. That's our priority. If the Bloc wants to debate this, well, fine. But as long as we are here on this side, we're going to be fighting for the real priorities of all Quebecers. The Honourable Member for rivière du nord Well, I'm proud to be a Bloc Québécois member, Mr. Speaker. If the trucker convoy was in Ottawa for 24 days, it's not just because there was a lack of coordination between governments, it's because there was a lack of leadership. The City of Ottawa asked uh, for something very simple, Mr. Speaker. Police officers, they needed 1,800, no matter where they came from. How many uh, RCMP officers did the federal government send? Well, 250. 250 out of an ask of 1,800. And they didn't send them to the streets of Ottawa. Most of them were deployed to the Prime Minister's house and department. Parliament. If the Prime Minister really believed that uh, the situation was so bad that his house needed to be protective, did he not also feel that it would have been justified to protect uh, all the population of Ottawa? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary.
Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for his question. During the illegal occupation last winter, people across the country were hurting, not just in Ottawa, but across the entire country. And Canadians' freedoms to feel safe in their homes were threatened. And that's why we invoked the Emergency Act, because it was the right thing to do, and it worked to end this illegal occupation in Ottawa and across the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, no. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Mr. Speaker, the federal government didn't do anything for three weeks before finally invoking the Emergencies Act. And we learned today at the Commission that all of the justification that they used to justify this extreme last resort measure were false, Mr. Speaker. CSIS uh, said yesterday that there was no foreign funding of the convoy. The OPP showed today that there was no credible threat of extremist violence. All of the government's excuses were false, Mr. Speaker. So finally, is the only reason why they used the Emergencies Act, was it to make up for the lack of leadership from the federal government over three weeks? The Honourable, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. With Speaker. And, and I, I think the Honourable Member has forgotten what it was like during that time and what the federal government was doing, working with the provinces, including the province of Quebec, working with the Ottawa Police Services, police services across the country, even the Premier of Ontario, the Conservative Premier, has said that he was standing shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister. Exactly. We invoked the Emergencies Act to keep Canadians safe, and it worked. Here Thank you, is. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, more than 60% of Canadians are struggling to put food on the table. Food bank use is up by 20%. Housing prices have doubled under this Prime Minister. And now he wants to make it more expensive for struggling Canadians to heat, them ho to heat their homes by tripling, tripling, tripling the carbon tax. Families will struggle to keep the heat on in February in Canada. Will the Prime Minister show some compassion for those struggling to heat their homes and cancel his plan to triple the carbon tax. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would like to quote from the Parliamentary Budget Officer's last report on pricing, not what the Conservative Party are saying about it, but what the Parliamentary Budget Officer actually said. And I quote, we project most households will see a net gain, receiving more in rebates from federal carbon pricing than the total amount they pay in federal fuel charges. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, these are falsehoods and failures of a tax plan disguised as an environmental plan. In four provinces, Canadians pay more in carbon taxes than they get back. And in the rest of the provinces, they don't get anything at all. And worse, this government hasn't hit a single environmental target. Emissions have gone up. If they were serious about making life more affordable, instead of freezing taxes, having freezing seniors, they would scrap the taxes. When will they scrap the carbon tax? Here, here. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, maybe it's time for the Conservative Party of Canada to come clean with this House and Canadians and admit to all that the fuel charge that will come into effect in 2023 won't come into effect before April, at the very earliest, April of 2023, so it will have no impact whatsoever on the cost of heating our homes over the winter, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Things are going uh, pretty badly in the country. It's clear the price of food has gone up by 11.4 percent, houses are unaffordable, and young people are sleeping in their parents' basements, Mr. Speaker. Winter is coming, and we know what that means in Canada. Home heating is not a luxury. Mr. Speaker, today we're asking the government to exempt all forms of home heating fuel from the carbon tax for all Canadians. Will they support us, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to uh, offer uh, to my colleague from across the way some uh, training on the difference between a uh, federal carbon tax and a cap-and-trade system for the government of Quebec. There is no increase that will take place in Quebec because the Quebec system is based on a cap-and-trade uh, system. It's not linked to the prices, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be happy to explain that difference to my colleague. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. 
The Pakistani government is cracking down on Afghans with threats of deportation and imprisonment by the end of the year. As they wait for their special immigration measure application to be processed, many Afghans' 60-day visa has already expired. For others, it will expire soon. Processing delays and the arbitrary cap to limit the number of Afghans who serve Canada to get to safety is going to cost lives. The situation is more urgent than ever. What action is the government taking to ensure Afghans who serve Canada are not thrown into prison or sent back to the Taliban? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, listen, we remain firm on our commitment to resettle at least 40,000 Afghan nationals to Canada, and this as quickly and safely as possible. We are processing application days and night for Afghan refugees and actually mobilize our entire workforce in helping. You know, Mr. Speaker, what I'm most proud is that actually just a few days ago, 311 Afghan can now call Canada home. We have almost 23,000 Afghanistan here, and Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with the Afghan, and our government is fully committed. Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, people are struggling with the destruction caused by the climate emergency, and it's only going to get worse. A report by the Canadian Climate Institute reveals the federal government needs to take greater action. By 2025, Canada will see an annual $25 billion loss to GDP, and it will only get worse every year. CCI found proactive measures are the best way to reduce those losses, but the Liberals are far behind. Will this government stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry and redirect those billions of dollars to help communities prepare for climate change? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable colleague for his question. Climate change is a very pressing issue, which is why our government is working hand-in-hand -hand with our colleagues in provinces, territories, Indigenous leadership, municipalities, to build the first-ever National Adaptation Plan so that Canadians are better prepared to fight climate change. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we are in the process of meeting our commitment to eliminating fossil fuel subsidies two years earlier than all of our G20 partners. This will be done by next year, Mr. Speaker. We these subsidies have already gone down from $12 billion to $4 billion just at EDC in the last few years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener South Hester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I announced a $1.4 million investment in Racer Machinery International. <clears throat> this investment by our government will create and maintain 31 jobs in the Kitchener area. Could the minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario update this House on how our government is supporting small businesses like Racer? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time I'm rising in this House as minister responsible for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario. And I wish to acknowledge that I am honoured excited and grateful to take on this new role. I want to thank the member for, from Kitchener uh, South Hespler for this question and for advocacy for small businesses. Our government knows that when we invest in small businesses like Racer, that it will create jobs and strengthen our economy. Supports like this will help entrepreneurs reach their full potential. And I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everyone a happy Small Business Week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Mr. Speaker, the evidence is in. The Liberals' soft-on-crime approach to uh, crime is not working. Violent crime is up 32 per cent in Canada wow. since they took office. Yet, incredibly, their Bill C-5 will eliminate mandatory jail time for serious firearms and drug offences, and even the offence of assaulting a police officer with a weapon. So for the sake of our communities, for the sake of police officers, for the sake of all law-abiding Canadians, please do the right thing. Will this minister withdraw his soft-on-crime Bill C-5? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question, and I congratulate him for being reappointed to his role as critic. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, I disagree with him on his, on his view of C-5. C-5 is about serious crimes, getting serious consequences, and getting the intention and resources that they deserve. We're doing that, Mr. Speaker, by taking the focus off 
uh, instances where uh, incarceration is not the solution, and hence the, the focus on removing a certain number of mandatory minimum penalties, where serious situations, Mr. Speaker, where public safety is at issue, will still get serious consequences. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Serious consequences, like serving house arrest and playing video games for discharging a firearm illegally? That is not a serious consequence, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Justice has permitted a catch and release justice system. Businesses are closing down, and people in my riding of Kamloops, Thompson Caribou are afraid to walk downtown in certain pockets, right. even in the daytime. We even have had a McDonald's closed down due to street crime. Bail has become the norm for repeat violent offenders. Will the government shut this revolving door? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question and congratulate him for his recent appointment as, as the second critic in this file. Mr. Speaker, public safety is our, is our priority, Mr. Speaker, and serious crimes will always carry with them serious consequences. Mr. Speaker, former Supreme Court Justice Michael Moldaver, who nobody in this House can accuse of being soft on crime, has said precisely that we need to dedicate more of our judicial and penal resources towards combating serious offences and treating those offences seriously, and conversely, taking away some of the resources for crimes that should not be punished by incarceration. Mr. Speaker, public safety is our number one. The Honourable Member for Kildon and St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the owner of a Winnipeg convenience store is in hospital with, serious, with a serious brain injury after he was attacked by thieves. Manitobans have become quite accustomed to seeing these daily headlines of assault, murder, arson, stabbing, stealings, break and enters. The perpetrators of these crimes are usually the same people, a revolving door of the bad guys getting away with it over and over and over again. This is the Canada we have after seven years of Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. So what's it going to take? for these Liberals to finally get serious and start protecting Canadian families from violent offenders. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we've been serious since we got elected about protecting Canadians. Our number one priority is to keep Canadians safe, and that's why we've introduced common sense firearms legislation like Bill C-71, like Bill C-21 that is at committee right now that will keep Canadians safe. It's measures that's supported by Canadians, and we hope that the honourable members across the way will support us in this legislation. The honourable member for Kildonan and St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals well know that gun violence is a result of criminals and gangs who smuggle guns across the American border, not licensed, trained, and vetted by police Canadian firearm owners, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Right. At the same time, these Liberals are letting violent offenders off the hook. This year, a woman in Winnipeg was robbed at gunpoint while holding her infant child and had her car stolen. The Liberals' Bill C-5 removes mandatory prison time for robbery with a firearm. So now this violent offender can serve house arrest because of he, he terrorized this woman. That's the world these Liberals have created for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. It is reckless. It will continue to fail to keep Canadians safe. Isn't that right, Mr. Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, public safety is our top priority. The kind of circumstance that the Honourable Member has just described is not the kind of circumstance that will carry with it a minimum mandatory penalty, Mr. Speaker. It will go to the other end of the sentencing spectrum, precisely because public safety is at risk and the, the, the act itself was serious, Mr. Speaker. What we are doing, what experts like former Supreme Court Justice Michael Moldaver are suggesting is that we concentrate our, our limited judicial resources in precisely those kinds of situations and free up by freeing up resources where public safety is not. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Repentigny. Do you know what is incompatible with the fight against climate change? The energy policy that the Deputy Prime Minister just announced in Washington. She announced that Canada will accelerate its oil and gas projects in order to sell as much as possible to Europe. The government even announced that it didn't care if it lost political capital, that it didn't care about public opinion, because the important thing is to sell gas to Europe. Mr. Speaker, what is less compatible with the fight against climate change than increasing oil and gas production for money? The Honourable Minister for Natural Resources. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government is determined to tackle the energy security crisis in the world. And so we're investing in great projects throughout the country. These projects must respect our climate ambitions and environment ambitions, respecting the rights of First Nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member for Avignon Metis Metan Metapedia. Mr. Speaker, it's very crying when the Minister for Natural Resources talks about a question about climate change. But the worst is that when the Liberals announce in Washington that they want to sell more oil and gas, they worry about their political capital. That is what the Deputy Prime Minister said, that uh, we have to be prepared to lose domestic political capital to sell fossil fuels in Europe. Instead of worrying about the impact of their choice on global warming, they think about their political capital. In this climate crisis, is it political capital or climate change that they should be worried about when they talk about selling oil and gas? The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the 70s, we thought that fighting climate change had to do with the environment for our, envi in, in, for our government. It's all MPs and all ministers who have this portfolio. Everyone has to fight against climate change, be it natural resources, transport, the Department of Justice, the Department of the Environment. And that is exactly what we are doing. And that is the reason for which in Canada there is twice as much investment made in clean technology than in oil and gas. The more we'll move forward, the more there will be investments in renewable energy rather than oil and gas. Number for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. News broke this afternoon that one of the companies that this government says they gave $1.2 million to for their Arrive Can boondoggle, well, that company says that they didn't get a dime. So, where's the $1.2 million? Who got rich? The Honourable Minister, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Throughout the pandemic, keeping Canadians safe has always been our top priority, and that was why we used the Arrive Can app. CBSA is aware of concerns surrounding contracts, and they're looking into the matter further. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Granville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. Say is concerned. Canadians are concerned because this Prime Minister's scandal-plagued record speaks for itself. This was an app that started out, it was supposed to cost $80,000, and the expenses ballooned to more than $54 million. Wow. It wrongly quarantined, forcing people into house arrest. 10,000 Canadians, wrongly. It's a boondoggle, it's a failed app, they've lost $1.2 million. Who got rich? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I wish the uh, party opposite would go back in time to a time when they were calling on us to close borders. We brought in the Arrive Can app to keep Canadians safe, and it worked. It's no longer mandatory. And Mr. Speaker, as I said, I, I'm just going to interrupt for a moment. I'm having a hard time hearing the parliamentary secretary. And I'm sure the Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, Rita Lakes would like to hear what she has to say. So I'm going to ask everyone to just take it down a notch and maybe just take a deep breath. And now we'll listen to the Parliamentary Secretary from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, it's starting again across the way. And I guess they just don't want to remember what it was like a year or two ago when Canadians were living with COVID we, and, and the Conservatives were calling on us to close the border, to stop letting people come in. We brought in the Arrive Can app to keep Canadians safe, and it worked, Mr. Speaker. As I said previously, CBSA is aware of issues with the contract, and they're looking into it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Niagara Falls. Speaker, the Liberals' continued use of the Arrive Can app destroyed any chance of recovery this summer for our Canadian tourism sector. Canadians are struggling, yet they deserve so much better. So they can be excused for being upset when this government committed $54 million to the disastrous Arrive Can app. Canadians simply want to know two things, Mr. Speaker. Who got rich at their expense, and when will you scrap this app? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Arrive Can app is no longer mandatory. Perhaps the Honourable Member has not been watching the news to know that, but I want to assure Canadians
means that it's still available for those who wish to use it. We brought in the Arrive Can app along with many other measures that we did during the pandemic because we were always putting Canadians' health and safety mm -hmm. as our number one priority. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bourassa. Mr. Speaker, Haiti has, has asked international aid to face this crisis in this country since corrupt political elites exacerbate the negotiations. Armed gangs are continuing to terrorize the Haitian population. Can the Minister for Foreign Affairs tell us what Canada will do in this case? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for his important question, but also for his solidarity with the Haitian people. Like so many Canadians, I'm deeply concerned about the situation in Haiti, which is why we are looking for solutions by the Haitians for the Haitians. The Prime Minister and I are committed to working with our counterparts, and that's the reason for which we sent a security equipment to the Haitian National Police. We are ready to impose sanctions against those who are funding gangs and who are fueling instability. Our message is clear. We will always stand by the Haitian people. Avoy Vamashi. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Uh, speaker, we heard some responses from the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Safety, but we didn't get an answer. So it's very clear. They said the app was going to cost $80,000, and then they said they gave this company $1.2 million of a total of $54 million on this boondoggle. And a co the company that they say that they gave $1.2 million to said that they weren't given a dime. So we asked who got rich. They don't know the answer. Here's a new, here's a new question for them. Who is lying? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I hope the Honourable Member is not accusing me of lying in this House. I, I really, I'm, I'm, Mr. Speaker, it's really hard to answer the question when I can't even hear myself think, Mr. Speaker. I've answered this question now four times, and if to, for the opposition to call the Arrive Can app a boondoggle when it was developed to keep Canadians safe is appalling. CBSA, CBSA is aware of issues with the contract, and they're looking. I'm just going to interrupt the parliamentary secretary for a second. I'm going to ask her. I, I'm going to ask her to uh, maybe give us the answer from the top again because it was hard for me. But wait, 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 wait. I'm just going to share a little story. Last night I was at a reception across the hall, and there were some people who were in the gallery, and they were looking down and they were identifying individuals who were screaming and shouting, and they were embarrassed for the individuals. I just want you to think of that when you're sitting in your seat, thinking that you're alone. You're not alone. You're either on camera or someone is watching. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, I'll let her start from the top to give an answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout the pandemic, our number one priority was the health and safety of Canadians. And the Arrive Can app was part of the response to that. As I have said numerous times in this House, CBSA is aware of issues with the contract and they're looking into them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are struggling because of the inflation caused by this Prime Minister and his government now as temperatures are dropping below zero across Northern Ontario, and the Liberals are planning to triple, triple, triple the taxes on home heating. People are worried, and they're wondering if they're even going to be able to afford to heat their homes this winter. Mr. Speaker, will this government do the right thing, finally recognize that home heating is not a luxury, and support our plan to cancel the taxes on home heating, yes or no? Yes. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, every Canadian household between Grand Prairie, Alberta, and Cornwall, Ontario received a check from the Government of Canada. This check was the Climate Action Incentive, and thanks to that program, 80% of households have more money in their pockets. Now, every Conservative politician in this House wants the Government to go back and pick the pockets of every single one of those households. Mr. Speaker, the affordability challenges that Canadians are facing today, that is something we simply will not do. The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, last night I spoke to Bonnie from a remote part of my riding who lives with her retired husband. They paid $900 last year to heat their home with oil, and that was double the year before. They just learned their bill this year is going to be $2,400. On a combined income of $25,000 a year, that means they're going to have to eat crickets in order to eat and heat. When will this government stop hurting Canadians and cancel its plan to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's very important to say to the Honourable Members across the House, climate change is real and it is an existential threat to the future of the human race. The Conservatives are proposing to make pollution free again, and now they are proposing to pick the pockets of the vast majority of Canadian families by taking away their quarterly rebate checks. This will make the climate crisis worse, it will drive away investment, and it will make everything more expensive. Mr. Speaker, our government will oppose Conservative political efforts to rob Canadians of this important financial support. The Honourable Member for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, this week is Small Business Week. Small businesses are the backbone of our communities across the country, especially in the Northwest Territories. They create jobs, economic growth, and are critical in post-pandemic recovery. Can the Minister responsible for CanNor please update this House on the important work our government is doing to support small businesses in the Northwest Territories? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for his important question and his hard work on behalf of small businesses in the Northwest Territories. Through CanNor's economic programs, we've supported hundreds of businesses in the North, including 200 women-led enterprises, over 100 owned by Indigenous peoples, and over 320 uh, in tourism. And today, I was pleased to announce $50,000 to the Yellowknife Chamber of Commerce to support uh, local business events in NWT. Our government will continue to be there for small businesses to help them grow and create jobs. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, Canadian families are struggling to keep up with the rising costs of groceries. The increase on food prices has hit a 41-year high, rising twice as quickly as people's wages. This week, we made the Liberals and the Conservatives admit that CEO corporate greed is driving up food prices. Now it's time for the government to take a stand and support families. When will the Liberals finally close tax loopholes, forcing CEOs to pay what they owe? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'm very happy to answer the question. As I stated in an earlier question, we have been focused on reducing poverty in this country. In fact, we've lifted millions of Canadians out of poverty, including seniors, including hundreds of thousands of children. We've done that through benefits like the CCB, the OAS, the GIS. We've indexed those benefits to inflation, so as the cost of living goes up, those benefits go up as well. And we're continuing to look at programs like the recovery div uh, dividend and the excess tax on excess profits for banks to make sure that everybody's paying their fair share. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Quote, establish a full and fully fund Canada Water Agency in 2022. Quote, modernize the 50-year-old Canada Water Act. These quotes are from the Liberal platform. A fully independent and integrated Canada Water Agency is urgently needed. We lack the scientific capacity to monitor water quality and quantity, to predict impacts, and to protect safe water. The climate crisis is a water crisis. No more announcements. It's time to create the Canada Water Agency. Will the minister update us as to plans to do it in 2022? 
The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for her question. We are, in fact, working to create an independent water agency for Canada. We need to have better, more information on, on water, better water management in Canada, because water, despite the fact that we have a lot of it in Canada, is also under threat because of climate change. We are working on this, and we will have good news to announce this House in the coming weeks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for question period today. I believe the government house leader has a question. Or, sorry, I'm sorry. The opposition house leader has a... Good time, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> yes, Mr. Speaker, it is Thursday, and this is the time when the uh, opposition asked the government uh, what we can expect in the weeks ahead. And we had uh, reason to be optimistic that there may be a piece of legislation that would enshrine the leader of the opposition's principled approach to government financing, where any new spending item might uh, would have to be accompanied by a spending reduction. Now, this is something that the opposition would entirely support if the government were going to introduce that next week. So I'm wondering if the government House Leader would inform the House as to the business for the rest of this week and into next week, and can we expect legislation to enshrine permanently the brilliant idea that the Leader of the Opposition has already proposed, Mr.